All right, good morning. Uh, thank you very much uh, for showing up to our presentation. And we'd uh, like to give you a, basically tell you a story about a, a journey that we went on and, and some of the things that we found in that journey. And it was fairly interesting. It originally was gonna last about a year. And I think JJ and I were sitting down and talking about this and of course it's a sign that I'm getting older, I'm losing track of time, but actually it took around two years to do. But we'll talk about what we did and- we're not finished yet, and, and, and how we got there. And so we're gonna talk about risk and capability and managing the balance. But before we do that, we'll introduce ourselves. So JJ first. Uh, my name is JJ Gerber. I'm Director of Flight Operations for Cougar Helicopters, and I've had that position for about seven years now. And my job is to uh, lead a, a team of men and women to uh, do some of the interesting things we do out on the East Coast. And uh, for that, as chief of the company, I've been with Cougar for 17 years. And before that, flight instructor as well as some time in the South African Air Force flying helicopters. Great, thanks, JJ. My background, an aerospace consultant. Uh, I did 22 years in the Canadian Air Force, experimental test pilot, taught down in California at the National Test Pilot School. Uh, worked at CAE for five years and then just went into business for myself and been working off and on with uh, Cougar for a while now, and especially on this project. So as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about risk and capability, and it is a journey and it is a story, and we hopefully will give you some insight into what we learned as we went through this. Because a lot of the stuff that ended up happening and a lot of the things that we had to adapt to and create and, and implement weren't always foreseen at the beginning of this adventure. Uh, I mean, it's important to think that uh, not everybody runs complex projects and not all of us build bridges or helicopters or so, but whatever you do in a smaller manner, I hope that some of these principles and lessons we learn you can take with you and, and whatever the project or, or the importance of something is that you do, that you remember that there are certain elements that you can handle in a certain way and uh, pick from that uh, what you can. But like any story in the beginning and in our case, it was a very unfortunate accident of 12 March 2009 when uh, 17 people lost their lives in an S-92 accident. And uh, what, what it started was a, a uh, avalanche of investigations and stakeholders who wanted to look at everything, not just the reason why the aircraft uh, went into the ocean, but uh, everything else that's got to do with the offshore world. And, um, it's quite an extensive list and a couple of explanations. Um, the CNLOPV you may not be familiar with because uh, typically it's either Transport Canada and your customer. Well, in the offshore industry uh, in the east coast of Canada, there's another layer of regulation that fits in there. It is a board, uh, it's a federal and provincial, um, and they govern the offshore operations. So they don't directly influence the op helicopter operator but they directly prescribe rules and regulations to the offshore companies such as uh, Husky, Suncor, uh, or Hibernia in this case. And uh, they lay down a bunch of rules and we have to, uh, through our customers and their uh, guidance, we have to comply as well. And uh, they were in charge of all the inquiries, uh, <coughs> Commissioner Wells, who we worked for the CNRB in that regard and his report was to the Offshore Petroleum Board. And from that, everything else flowed. So, uh, bottom line is a lot of stakeholders investigated, met, and came up with a bunch of recommendations. So what you don't see on this list is the Transportation uh, Board of Canada, uh, because at the time when we started this, their final report wasn't done that, uh, although we had some preliminary information from them. The other thing I'd like to add is, uh, you, JJ's touched on one of the key stakeholders, and, but there's a, that, that word's very key for us, because there was the CNLPB, which it took me a long time to be able to say that, by the way. It's quite the acronym. And then we had, uh, you go down to Cougar itself, the company, um, the employees in the company, all these different stakeholders, the senior management, they all have areas of worry or concern. Then we had the operators that, that were, were part of the stakeholders. Uh, JJ alluded to the CNLPB. We had Transport Canada involved in that. We had the general public. They played an important role in this, believe it or not, because it's a very tight-knit community in the East Coast, and, and they, they, uh, they played in a role in the sense of their opinion and watching what was going on. So all these different stakeholders could have created a recipe for disaster, but we'll show you how all of this was managed and how we were able to move forward. So out of this, the, um, 
they created a, a report, a very extensive report, and a series of recommendations. And I, these recommendations are grouped into three. And the first one is the complete eight operational requirements, and I'll get into this in a minute on the next slide. Recommendation two was talking about risk. Create a risk management process that is robust and is continuous and ongoing. And, and in fact, not only did we do this, this was key to some of the successes that we had, this continuous ongoing risk management. And then the last one there is, to get back into night flying, do we just go straight back into night flying the way things were before, or do we have a measured approach? And so we were asked to look at that. You'll see here at the, at the, at the bottom here as we've designed it or set it up in terms of the risks, how everything flowed together. But the reality is they, 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 they overlapped and, and had an impact in each other. It was definitely a multi-layered approach. Now the first recommendation, and I talked about that on, on the previous slide, these are what we were, the items that we were asked to focus on. They provide us with a lot of detail, what they meant, these are just the titles, but we had to look at creating a SAR capability. Easy thing to say, difficult thing to implement. Uh, this is the kind of thing that the Department of National Defense in Canada spends tens of millions of dollars on each year to deliver that kind of capability. And in that capability, look at night ditching, what does it mean to ditch at night, how do we rescue people? How do people escape from helicopters? All these nightmare scenarios we had to take a look at and show how we could respond to them. And then the next set of requirements deals with training. Do we have a good training program? Is it sufficient to meet the risks and to mitigate those risks? So we went through that. The fatigue management program was a key one and one that we had to spend a lot of time thinking about, figuring out how we could actually address that. And the last two, the, the, we had to show how we could work with the Department of National Defense and SAR. Can't just go off, do our own SAR thing and not work with the Department of National Defense because that is their mandate in that area to do search and rescue. So we had to figure out how do we coordinate activities with a commercial organization like Cougar who's doing SAR and with the Department of National Defense who's also doing SAR. And the last one was take a look at bird activities at night. So this was the starting point, the prerequisites for the return to night flying. This is where we were. We wanted to lay that ground out for you so you understand what we were asked to do and what the context was in terms of stakeholders. This is uh, our presentation outline. Uh, we're going to talk about risk management, uh, some of the issues that we were facing, and yes, I don't know if you had heard from the other group or not because probably you didn't, that's why you're here. Uh, we're gonna have a group participation. And you're all going, ah, oh, jeez. But anyways, we're gonna do it anyways. So we're gonna be doing, talking about that later and we're gonna divide you up and give you a chance to give some feedback and, and participation in this. After that, we're gonna talk about SAR implementation, the challenges and the lessons learned, do the same for training, the same for team management, and then end it up at the conclusion. So risk management, I touched on this earlier. This was key to this program. Uh, you know, everybody talks about risk management and some people and some organizations do it in varying degrees. What well, we came to realize between JJ and I that we had to do this on a continuous basis because the whole situation kept mutating on us and so what was valid three weeks ago stopped being valid today and we learned our lesson that this had to be ongoing. Now, Everybody knows the standard risk management process and how you do it and look at cause factors and risk mitigation and, and so on and so forth. But one of the principles we follow is the one used by the operators on the East Coast called ALARP. As low as reasonably practicable. And really it's about trying to find that balance between mission capability so you can still stay in business and managing the risk that goes along with that. And what is that balance? That's always in a gray area. It's always a challenge. There's never an easy answer, but this is the principle that we followed and in guiding us in, in the risk management approach. So when we uh, <coughs> first got together as a group to discuss the recommendations and so on, we spent quite a bit of time on this aspect, and uh, because not all of us were familiar with it, and so we trained on this very concept first, and said, okay, now let's go out and, and get the work done. It was essential that we drew a baseline amongst each other. So the challenge of the offshore flight environment. So you may ask, um, am I flying so what? I mean, the aircraft doesn't know it's dark and so on. And uh, uh, you know, why would you want to do night flying? And it's all got to do with the environment that we fly in that has its own challenges. Um, 
And uh, you can go to the next one, thank you. Offshore flying is not a big mystery to, to all of us, either you've read about it, you've heard about it, but there's a couple of unique things that kick in in St. John's uh, and Nova Scotia. Um, first of all, uh, we're pretty far uh, uh, north, and so in winter we really don't have enough daytime to get the job done. And so when we talk about night flying, we're not discussing uh, 11, 12 o'clock at night uh, flying passengers offshore. We just want a regular day, and let's call it for argument's sake, uh, 7 to 7. Well, if you want to do that, then you start off in the dark and you're going to end up in the dark. And you can imagine that uh, even uh, one hour before sunset, if somebody has to ditch a helicopter, and it's two hours away from shore. It doesn't matter what you do, you need night capability. The day is just simply too short, and you don't know how things are going to turn out, especially in the emergency. Uh, we got uh, long range flying, 270 to 200, and this year we may be doing up to 280 miles. That's a pretty long way to go, and uh, that brings about its own stress in the crew that's going to have to go, especially if the weather is uh, pretty low offshore and they know they have to do a missed approach. We do a lot of missed approaches. It's roughly about 10% of our flights, and we live with it, but still, as a pilot, you know, your stomach clench up a little bit as you're doing the list of posts because everything's really slow and close in the an offshore environment. You can't see a thing. So all that uh, repetitive missions, that brings up another thing. You know, it's the one thing to, uh, to plan a flight and get going and, and figure out everything, and you know, you know, it's going to be four hours before I see land again, except for the rig. And you get through the process, you plan the flight, and you go, you come back, you have to do it again. And guess what? Tomorrow, they get to do it all over again. One of our pilots coined a phrase, he said, it's the relentless slog of getting this done. Nothing changes. And so that's a little bit of a thing for helicopter pilots. I mean, you, your job is varied and so on, not over there. You want it to do precisely the same thing every day, and repeat, 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 precisely correct. That in itself brings about a certain amount of stress and, and uh, inconvenience to us. And uh, you know, combined with the concept that we will not fly in the dark anymore, everything got compressed into the available time. And you can do what you want. People are going to start to uh, you know, feel a little bit of angst of getting it done. And so you know, it's not a case of just stopping to fly at 5 o'clock. If we don't get everyone by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we're not back in time. So our day is really short. And the last point I want to uh, just uh, oh, point out, if you can just go back, uh, the second bullet there, um, as Keith alluded to, it's a very close-knit community. And our employees uh, had a real hard time, for right or wrong reasons. But, uh, you know, it seemed to us for a while we could do nothing right in the eyes of the public. Right? Uh, we would do something, we would turn around for the smallest little light that comes on, as you would. But they heard on the radio, press shows up, take pictures of us landing and so on. And next thing, the crew that did the right thing goes home, and there they class it on television, uh, what's going on at Kruger, you know, how come it's so unsafe and so on. It's not. It's not true, but that's what people's perception. And our employees face that quite regularly, even as much as last week as well. So, you know, we're talking five years later and it's still going on. So that environment is uh, some, some, some unique peculiarities to it that weigh down on us and we have to keep uh, working with that and adjust for those pressures that's on the crew. All right, returning to night flying, the challenges. Uh, you can imagine that it's one thing to maintain a capability, that takes a lot of effort, proficiency, training, but once you stop it, it degrades very quickly, that capability. And so the change of operations with respect to cancellation of night flying, uh, now the organization is starting to lose its capability to fly at night. Uh, we've got limited daylight hours to meet the flight schedule tasking. JJ alluded to that earlier in the previous slide. And what I'm trying to do is paint this sort of starting point for you so you understand where we started from and where we ended up. Uh, the reduction in night flying proficiency, uh, I, I've been involved in this before. You can watch how uh, people who do the flying business, that if they don't do a particular task in an aircraft, then there becomes a reluctance to do that task and it starts to feed on itself. So if you're not doing something like night flying and then you start talking about returning to night flying or returning to anything, you start to hear people say, well, we don't really want to do that, do we? And you know, well, I, you know, that's, that's a lot of effort, and are we sure we want to do this? And you start to see this come in, and that is very normal in flying organizations. We started to see that. 
Uh, new fatigue management patterns emerge because now we don't have to deal with night flying. We still have to deal with fatigue and sometimes different types of fatigue, but only during the day ops. And, and this would get into the last one, the operational management style now just becomes focused on a day ops tempo. So we don't have to worry about the things that, that you have to worry about when you do night ops. So the tempo really changed in office, as I said, uh, where in the past we had a comfortable, normal work day. All of a sudden you have this absolute flurry of activity in the morning. First thing, get all the aircraft going and here by lunchtime, everything just relaxed because there's nothing you can do from this point on. You have no more time left if the flight doesn't mean uh, left. So it really changed that operational style of the day for us. And I think the key takeaway from this, which is what you see down on the bottom, is that the cancellation of night flying did not re reduce risk to zero. There were a number of people that would say, well, by eliminating night flying, we've reduced the risk to zero. And, and so we don't have to worry about that. We've now contained the risk. And the reality was, no, we did not. We migrated the risk. And that's the problem with risk, is if it would just stay in one place so we can keep an eye on it all the time, that'd be great. But sometimes it migrates and it moves, and it moves into another area. And as you try to, and we found this on this program, as you try to reduce risk lower and lower and lower and lower, it then jumps to somewhere else because what ends up happening is you optimize the situation for the reduction of risk in this area, which de-optimizes it in another area. And this is something we'll talk about as we go through this. So the starting point, the organizational night off proficiency is low. Same for on the air crew side. No one's fault, just the fact of life. Also, what was starting, what had happened is that energy technology had been around for a long time for the military, but it was certainly becoming something that was available in the civil sector. And, and in Canada, uh, lagged a little bit behind the United States in terms of getting this kind of technology into the civil sector, but it was now available. Transport Canada had now gotten its mind around it and was ready to prove that sort of thing, and the regulatory environment had changed as a consequence. We had introduced a new flight control system into the, into the two of the helicopters, fourth axis auto hover capability. Uh, we needed to address fatigue management and, and create a fatigue management plan so that operations could be aligned with night flying because this whole focus of this program was how do we get through all these requirements that were identified in the requirement to get us back into night flying. And of course we need to be able to operate with D&D SAR. So the challenge for us was we want to implement night flying but how do we do this safely now that we had stopped doing it for quite a while. Just uh, one clarification point, before uh, all this happened, we did have a measure of rescue capability. In fact, um, on the day of the accident, we managed to rescue the lone survivor with one of our helicopters, and we had two rescue helicopters in the air before um, the, the whole effort of the National Defense uh, was mustered to, to help us out and, and take over the rescue. We were first response, and they were rescued. Um, and so uh, there was some measure, and ins inside of us we believed we had some capability, but what the inquiry pointed out to us was, no, we need to enhance that capability quite significantly. All right, the part you've been dreading, I'm sure. Group participation, we're interested in your opinion. Uh, we wanted to do it this part in the presentation. We didn't, before we told you what we did, we'd like to hear, for our benefit, what your opinion is as to what you see as the major issues, and we'll give you an indication of how we want to do this. We want to focus on two areas, training and fatigue. We're going to dr divide the room in half and get JJ to do that. We're going to give you 10 minutes to talk amongst yourselves and your own table, and we're going to pick two tables from each section. So all you'll be given is one topic in your, your, your section, training or fatigue, and JJ will divide that up. And then we'll, we'll go and randomly pick a couple of tables in each section and ask the spokesperson to get up and give their input as to what do you think the key issue was in that topic and, and where do you think the best path would be to move forward. So think about what you know at this point, uh, what we've shared with you at the moment, a, a challenging environment. Uh, both at the technical level, emotional level, political level, call it what you want. Uh, a slightly inadequate regulatory environment that uh, sort of barely touches on fatigue, it barely touches on SAR, and so on. It's not very good help out there. Uh, think about uh, the, the reduction in daytime and the operational pressure that that brings about. Think about the things we've shared with you at this point. 
And what we want you to do is just highlight a few things that you think. If you were to implement a program in the section of either training or fatigue, these are the things you either need to throw away, deal with, or investigate further. And I think it will help you in the little discussion around the table. So if you go ahead and divide them up, JJ, and then we'll give you 10 minutes to talk. Yeah, I think the room, uh, sort of the tables from this point backwards, uh, let's take that as the training issues and, and the tables up, up uh, ahead of me, uh, the fatigue issues. And we'll give you uh, 10 minutes or so, and uh, or until we hear it starts getting quiet, we'll come around and, uh, and uh, see what you have for us. And you can also get us to come over, and if you've got some questions uh, about the background, yeah, we can certainly talk about that. So yeah, maybe join up later on. All right, silence, great. Okay, so we're gonna pick some tables at random. JJ's gonna be the random picker. So uh, go for it, JJ, pick a table. Uh, okay, we've been asked to look at the uh, trading issues. And, uh,
So we went more into the types of training that the pilots would have to receive, which would include night vision goggles, if the, uh, which is a good idea to have their own fleet doing rescue operations as they're in the area when an accident could potentially happen. Uh, the pilots would have to receive fourth axis uh, training with the uh, control stability augmentation system. And uh, also you would have to uh, promote to the public that you're going to be able to do this safely, which I don't really have many ideas on it, rather than start doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks. Well, that's just a little bit of To us, it came down to having developed a very, very robust risk management plan. So the ideas that we, we recognize that would have to be factored into that risk management plan is, is the, the fact that you've got an incredibly intense level of activity followed by an incredibly dull level. Uh, so there would be a need for an extremely detailed task plan to ensure that that very, very small window of activity is optimally utilized. Uh, the recognition of the you would need to uh, probably reduce the, the typical uh, crew tasks during that um, uh, that initial period so that they're not exhausted before they, they take off. So you'd be looking at bringing increased resources during that, that uh, um, high activity phase. Uh, then the other factor that we looked at is recognizing that you've got a high level of intense activity followed by an hour and a half of the most dull, boring, fine you can possibly imagine. So the need to come up with with ways, <laughs> well, as a no uh, the need to come up with ways to to make sure that the, the crews are appropriately stimulated uh, to maintain the optimal um, attention and, and focus during that flight. So maybe uh, increased communication, maybe some in-flight procedures to to help mitigate that uh, potential drop in in, uh, in adrenaline or, or activity. Uh, recognition of um, uh, stress management for the crews. Uh, Phil made the point that uh, St. John's is an extremely tight knit community. Um, you get a guy that gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning and, and does his business, goes around the paper, gets a, a copy of Timmy's. He's already got 16 interactions with people who know somebody who died in that accident. How does that affect his ability to? <coughs> to stay focused on, on his job that day. So you need to, to recognize how, you need to recognize that there are unusual and intense stresses right from the get-go. Um, medical review is obviously a, a consideration. Uh, probably increased uh, uh, attention to uh, flight crews, uh, um, physical and, and, and mental states, and, and one of the points that came over the session yesterday is typically you ask the pilot, how are you feeling? Inevitably, the pilot is the last person that should be giving an opinion on how they feel. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty much I can get some opinions from the table over here. It's a spokesperson, Ms. Shanks. Also on the team. So for us, I right, we took it as a team management, the issues that's running that, and our discussion led us to talk about the complexity of the team systems. In Australia, it's fairly complex. It's and dangerous it's still times. Uh, and they're coming up with a new standard very soon. So we just need to sign over. And in terms of solutions, just a lot of CASA and regulators to make sure that the team management is clear and concise about both interpretations. Well, great. Thanks a lot for your feedback. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. And, and it's always good to hear someone's opinion after they've heard. Uh, what the baseline is and where we're starting from. And then we'll show you what we encountered and uh, what we had to deal with as we went through this process. Well, I've learned that's, uh, that's actually a pretty good knowledge uh, just in this group already. And it's and certainly, uh, certainly interesting how accurate you are. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come, come to that now in a second. So this is the first part that we'll talk about is implementing a SAR capability. Now there were two elements to the Cougar operation. There was what we call the line crews, and the line crews were responsible for transporting passengers to and from the oil platforms. We had the SAR crews, and I'm making this sound like they're distinct and separate, but not, that's not the case. 
but, but from an organizational point of view they are. And their, their job was to be on SAR standby and to do everything you would expect a SAR crew to do. Now the interesting thing is because of manning levels, and that was alluded to by one of the, the comments made earlier during your, your presentations is, we've got people that are working on the line crews who are also working in the SAR crew. And so we had to differentiate between the two and figure out what the training requirements were for SAR. And SAR, uh, and I'll get into this in a minute here, but, it, but it's the only one that dealt with the MGs. The others on the line crews would be dealing with night flying unaided. So this is the requirements that came out. Uh, looked at it from a, a capability perspective. We needed a search and rescue capability. And what does that mean? Because that can mean so many different things to so many different people. Uh, and the other thing we needed to look at was response time. We needed to be able to respond in a, in a, in a time, in a timely manner that was expected by the operators and by the community as well. So we had to demonstrate responsiveness and an effective SAR capability. Here are the recommendations that came out from the inquiry report. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but the, the key ones are highlighted there in blue is uh, first response SAR equipped aircraft. Now these aircraft have an AFCS modification in them or an addition to allow them to do auto, auto hover approaches, very important for search and rescue. And we had to meet a wheels up time, 20 minutes during normal ops and 45 minutes outside of normal ops. So you can imagine, it's not just about the training, but what's the infrastructure you have to create to enable that kind of response time. And then recommendation seven, we need to show how we're gonna work with DMD. And I talked about that earlier. It's just not as easy as just showing up with DMD and they bring their helicopter, you bring your toy and out you go and have fun. We, f we needed to figure out how we were gonna coordinate things if anything ever did happen and who was controlling what. And the, in Canada, the SAR, the SAR response is controlled through the rescue coordination centers. So how was Cougar going to integrate itself into that so there was concurrent and, and mutually supporting activity? So here's the capability definition of the SAR helicopter and, and its crews and what we were trying to achieve. First of all, trained and qualified SAR personnel, not only just pilots, but we're talking about SAR techs as well people who will go and do the actual rescue in the back. We're fortunate that we had a lot of people that had transitioned from the Department of National Defense and had moved in to Cougar, and the same on the pilot side as well, so we at least could do that. The SAR 4th Axis AFCS equipment, great to have that kind of capability, but you have to train for it. Now what's interesting, and we'll get into this at the bottom for the takeaway, is now we have a non-standard fleet configuration. We have two helicopters that are in a certain configuration, main of the helicopters in another configuration, and pilots on the line side and the SAR side can fly either. So you can imagine, the, and I've been in, in, in organizations where that's occurred, now we're starting to see risks migrate and risks start to emerge from areas we didn't first anticipate. Mission capability, we needed to think about training and operations for night vision because we brought that into the SAR capability. It's now fully implemented, FLIR, search, hoist, and all the rescue equipment that comes along with doing SAR. And, and at the end of the day, we ended up with two SAR-equipped S-92s, very, very similar to the rest of the fleet, but some differences, and that's what we talk about a non-standard fleet capability. This is something, not only do we have to implement the training, the procedures, and get Transport Canada on board, and we'll talk more about that, but now we have a non-standard fleet. So uh, we had to build a quite a bit of redundancy into the system because then the rules changed. It said if you don't uh, have that SAR capability ready to launch in 20 minutes, at this very minute you can't fly fast enough <coughs> to the effect that if for some reason the primary SAR aircraft goes unserviceable, we stop what we're doing, make another one SAR, and then the operation carries on. And even to the effect that if uh, an aircraft is on its way <coughs> offshore and it lands on a deck, waits there until we can reconfigure a SAR aircraft and then they can proceed the operation. That's how critical it was and important it was, and rightly so. Right? Once, you, once you have the service, there can be no moment where, oh, maybe today we don't need that level of service. It needs to remain. So the redundancies are, uh, for example, the picture at the top right there, dual hoist. You can't go 200 miles offshore and just let an electrical circuit breaker stop you from rescuing somebody. So dual hoist. And this issue of the two SAR uh, S92s, remember what I said? We had one primary. So it 
So only side crews fly that one, but then the backup aircraft is almost ready for start, but it's got seats. And it's got all the buttons and systems that, that the SAR AFC has uh, needed. And you could end up in a scenario where a normal flight crew, uh, by not paying attention, pressed the wrong button and the aircraft will just stop. And all that's what it's going to annoy somebody. And so we need to teach the rest of the pilots how the SAR AFC has worked so that they can know and identify issues and fly away from that and it does not happen. So that's, uh, we, as, as, as Keith alluded to here, it's not playing the whack-a-mole game and you press down on this over here and another one pops up over there. So all of a sudden, okay, now with that type of training program, go back and teach the guys the different systems. The challenges started showing up pretty quickly. Um, the first one was quite, quite interesting and, and even as we were preparing the presentation, we thought about uh, you know, why that was. But quite frankly, when you put out a GAN chart or any kind of progress line for a project, uh, what you have to watch out for is people start perceiving that as deadlines and feel the pressure on them to actually um, get on with it. But really, it's, it's a timeline to measure one thing that happens after another. But you have to watch what people do with that information and it doesn't turn into some sort of artificial pressure. Uh, MBT training program, pretty interesting. You know, Transport Canada has uh, now lately uh, put out some policy around this, but, uh, and that was very helpful. But we borrowed heavily from military programs and the very bare guidelines there is. Different levels of crew experience. Um, you know, we have guys uh, who attack, attack uh, uh, tactical helicopters, and there people that just flew it in civilian world. And you have to temper those expectations and say, no, we're not going to run around stealthy around the world. We just want to be able to land, take off, and, and, and rescue somebody with their energies for the SAR crew. Um, and as I said, there was very limited regulation for SAR. I mean, the country Canada touches on a few aspects, um, uh, with hoisting and class D operations, some very basic guidance on performance, whether you're doing it for hire or rescue, <coughs> and um, really nothing substantial. So we had to make stuff up uh, with them and, and came up with a list of things. And uh, quite frankly, uh, about a year before we actually submitted our ops manual, we wrote a letter to Transport Canada and said, here's what we're going to do, this is what we want, and these are the limits we need. And you can imagine if we fly in foggy weather and an aircraft is in conditions, which we train for. But how do you rescue somebody in a fog bank? Uh, you know, it's a visual maneuver. So we had to come up with some ridiculously low um, BFR, um, um, IFR limits um, to which the helicopter can operate. Keep in mind, it's got an orbit flight system that can do that. But what is the regulation that supports you flying in cloud um, 100 feet above the water looking for somebody. There's no regulation like that. So we had to build up a framework of rules based on some of the systems we had in place and came up with some limits, proposed that to Transport Canada, and they took their time, as they should have, to work through them systematically. They even went to the Department of National Defense and said, how does that fit with what you guys do? And they came back and said, no, it would. So this issue of limited regulation uh, you know, really challenged us. Managing aircraft configuration, you know, the maintenance guys that we brought along, pilots find the shiny new toys really interesting and we all want to have them and we all want to play with them, but there's a whole part of the organization that has to come along with you, whether it's the finance department, even the control goods stuff that, that, that really is interesting here in, in Canada and interesting is really not the right word for it. But the whole organization had to be drawn in to help us do that. <coughs> SOPs development, and the other thing is, and I look at the bottom one, and there's two things for managing fatigue. The very fatigue of running the project, and then how are things changing for us. Those are the challenges we faced, and it needed some leadership in each one of those mm -hmm. departments, uh, whether it's our customers. Transport Canada shows some tremendous leadership and saying, no, we're going to help you deal with this, because it's only a matter of time. So everybody, you know, played their part, and definitely the bottom takeaway for us, leadership was definitely needed in all areas. Now, the, 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 le the lessons we learned, as I covered uh, probably most of them already, but, uh, you know, this <coughs> timeline management, people's fatigue, you've got to stay in touch with people and, and see what they're doing, monitor progress. Another one there is aggressively look for feedback, and I really liked the video yesterday mo uh, well, on Monday morning that Tony Kern put up, uh, where the birds are chirping and then all of a sudden it gets very quiet. Well, you know, after a couple of days, you know people are working on stuff. You don't start, you're not getting the emails back. You want to know what happened, what's going on. You've got to pick up the phone and say, how's it going? Oh, I'm stuck on that subject, or, or I'm really struggling within a specific area, or I'm not getting anywhere. 
And if you don't go after that and draw it out of them, you're not going to be in a position to be the leader that you require and to manage it. Incremental capability deployment, you really have to take baby steps. Um, I talked about the night vision training, for example. We had all these people that flew some very amazing profiles when they were in the military with MEGs. We had to pull that back and say, no, we're just going to take off, fly, land, maneuver, and that's all we're going to do. And lower our expectations for what we're going to do. It's a commercial application of MEG, not a military application. And then, uh, you know, aligning expectations with Transmit Canada, I talked about that. That was an interesting process in itself, but it can be done. You know, I was amazed at where we got with Transmit Canada by just systematically walking them with us through that. And that's a timeline management. One of the reasons why it actually took two years. I mean, we thought this was all done and it uh, made a lot of sense to us because we believed we could do it safely. We had the HFDM program to back us up and say, when we say a crew is going to fly at 100 feet, we know they do. And all those tools were in place, the SMS system, the Transmit Canada wanted to walk us slowly. And it was the right thing to do because it took us uh, the same amount of time to, to get that incremental uh, uh, capability. And the last one there, third party validation. Uh, I can tell you guys the ability to, to, to manage a project like that and live, or at least understand that you have to live with the consequences of changing that, um, that comes from validating. As you know, the kids like the expression, drink your own Kool Aid, right? Uh, you know, we like doing that, but how do you know you're doing it right? And so we had several organizations uh, talked about the, the basic concept of night flying. And we used night flight concepts down in Houston. And that team helped us with temporary expectations, really don't low down and say no, or call before you can walk. Um, uh, the other organization that we got in was the squadron, Dan Bitterman, he's around at the, at the convention as well. And their, their team called the squadron, they came and audited us. And not only that, they helped us risk assess the whole thing. And they came and said, yeah, if we were to do this, we would do exactly the same thing. And it really helps at the leadership level. It helps with finances. It helps with, with uh, you know, telling your customers that this is OK. You know, it seems complex, but it's going to work. And then we heard here about the public opinion. It helps with that as well. We can put that on our list and say, no, we didn't just come up with this stuff. We had somebody else help us uh, come up with it. And so you know, the big thing for me was those three entities uh, that came and looked at us. And uh, sorry, I mentioned three, and there's the other one over there. I keep, uh, you know, I'm an entity. We got to know our organization over the years, but this was very really different. And, uh, you know, just like we're doing in this presentation, it was that stop, think about that, let's do it again, let's back up a little bit, let's go talk to the customers, let's try and do it differently. Uh, that was the leadership that Keith gave to as well. Third party assessment, when it gets complex, it really helps. The other thing I'd like to add, too, is, and it's just normal in organizations that trying to get feedback from everybody in the organization is, is always a challenge, especially when the feedback's coming from the operators or the people working the machines, whether it's maintenance personnel or pilots, to senior management. You can have great senior management like they have at Cougar, but people, people are still reluctant to say anything. But they're not reluctant to say something to me because in their eyes, I pose no threat, I have no value. You know, it, just, it just has, I'm there, I'm doing a job. And the same when we brought in uh, the squadron, they were willing to say things that they may not otherwise have been willing to say. And, and we really needed that feedback and that sanity check, and it made a huge difference. And that was one of the benefits. Not only did these external agencies come in and tell us stuff, but they were also able to act as conduits for information from the rank and file, and that was so very important. So they keep the government office to sit down and say this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a little chat. Okay, training challenges. Of course, all these subjects that we're talking about all overlap, uh, even though we're, we're presenting them in a discrete fashion. So the training, we had to show that we had the required training in place or about to be put into place that would allow us to transition back to night flying safely. Again, easily said, not so easily done. So we had to show, for example, how could we show that we can do ditching at night successfully? And so we can't use a real aircraft for that. Um, and so how do we do that in the simulator? Well, we can do a lot of training in the simulator. We can, we can demonstrate profiles. But we had to go through and, and get our mind around this and then not only convince ourselves, but convince people who are not in aviation. As I mentioned before, there are a lot of stakeholders involved and, and they were important stakeholders and they had a right to be stakeholders, but some of them had no knowledge about aviation whatsoever. 
Sufficient fidelity, background in simulation, so I understand this, the need for fidelity and what type of fidelity that you need to be able to carry out some of this kind of training. And then the last one, and, and I have to compliment uh, Barry, great training program that he put together. Uh, this is really important because you can have all these tools, all these simulations, simulators, flight training devices, they're totally meaningless unless you have a training program that makes sense. And a lot of thought was put in the training program and we had to demonstrate this to all the stakeholders on a number of occasions down in Lafayette that we had everything it took as a combined training solution to make this work. So the training metrics gives you some sense of what we're looking at. We had to look at proficiency, currency, how we were gonna get pilots back up to these levels and not impact the operation that was going on. So we didn't just down tools. Like in, sometimes in the military, we'll take a squadron and we'll stop it from doing its business and let it retrain for something. Couldn't do that in this case. We still had to run a business. Uh, be able to show how we could exit the aircraft, the ditching, detailed st standards and training objectives and so that we could demonstrate that we had the metrics to prove that the training was actually effective before we could return back to night flying, that we had brought everybody back up to speed. And the other bullets there are talking about model fidelities, flight simulation fidelity, visual fidelity, all this stuff plays a valuable role in helping execute the training plan. Bottom line, the required proficiency is, is the training enablers like the simulator plus the training program. And without the training program, it doesn't work. And we, we put this together as a training solution and we were able to demonstrate uh, that we were able to start training the pilots and bring them back up to proficiency. So the challenges, as Keith said, we are in business to run, we have passengers to fly, we have done the time to do it, and uh, that does not change. You know, thousands of people in the area there <coughs> goes back and forth to the offshore environment, their day didn't change. So we have to kind of fit in what we wanted to do somewhere else. And it was very difficult to schedule training. And you know, as much as any manager wants to accept the fact that pilots and, and, and the rest of the team needs to train, it's still a pain in the neck, right? Because it takes them away. Um, either you have to backfill with overtime, it costs a lot of money because we can't train with the aircraft we're doing the work with, we have to go to the simulator. And, and you fit that in where you can. And it's always been just the second, you know, the cousin that nobody wants to talk to. But we know we have to do it. And so it, it had to fit in somewhere. Alignment, my training program, new pro, uh, new, the new requirements. It wasn't good enough just to say we're going to do some deck landings in the simulator. And, uh, and as Keith said, you know, uh, Barry is over there, he's our chief pilot for training. It took a lot of time uh, to, to determine performance standards and say, you know, when we take off from the rig, I want you to lower those three degrees. And I'm going to check that you're going to lower it. It's probably five degrees. Right? You know what I'm saying. So that measurement that each instructor had to be trained to look for, because we wanted to come away from that. Being able to say, we know the the pilots will do it right. We don't want them to say, yeah, we presented the syllabus. We wanted the feedback. And so again, HFDM program, get that loop going. And it was a very thorough program and took a lot of time to do. Night readiness of each crew, it was just a simple case of um, uh, getting everyone's head switched onto the fact that we're going to go night flying. And uh, I may have suggested it earlier, but the point is, we're still not night and we've been training for over a year. You can imagine the question, why am I going out last year to do night training? We haven't decided yet, but we have to be ready. And the, uh, the, the upside of all this was, and uh, I, I know because we look at HFDF, the pilots are flying more precise. The exercises are done correctly. We know for a fact that we're better at what we do now. And so we can try and get that message back to them. Yes, you may not be night flying, but guess what? You have the body just now spread. And, uh, you know, the training has to be repeatable. Every instructor has to have the same song sheet and work off that and be able to, to do that. But the bottom line is we have to make sure training becomes institutionalized, whether it's the schedulers, whether it's the finance department, what they expect, our training provider, the simulator, everything had to be geared for this and repeated actually four times a year. They can train from St. John's, going out of get training, get back. One day's training. Had to be institutionalized to be uh, accepted. And it doesn't change, uh, you know, the fact that uh, 
we had to, to, to keep doing our business, fit the training in where it had, and we had to uh, f uh, you know, put it within the business tempo. We had to have the training plan going, the objectives, measure, come back, see where we had to adjust. We had to make some adjustment and uh, uh, SOP change. And then there's the issue about a standard. You have to be prepared that no matter how much pressure it is on the personnel pool to do the job, if it's one person or more than one person that don't make it great, you got to tell them, and if need be, you, you fail. And, and because you're just simply putting the person in a situation that you never be in. And it's gonna, just going to hurt everybody. Everybody down the line, including that person himself. But be firm, when you have your standard, and you've seen it work on 99% of the cases, don't second guess yourself on that one and say, oh, but he was having an off day. Whatever the case may be, be prepared to fail somebody if you need it. And it must be rigorously applied. Just did the training myself and Barry had no problem stopping the similar and saying, what did you just do? Let's back up and do it again. Okay? That's what needs to happen. And continuously monitor the proficiency we have. And this is where I like Flight Safety International slogan. You know, the best safety tool you have is a well-trained crew. And that is it. You know, effective training. That means the simulator as well as the program to match with the standards to measure it by is one of the key elements of this. Okay, on the, on the last subject that we'll touch on is fatigue management. And it's a subject that's near and dear to everybody's heart that's in this business, but it's also a challenging one to get your arms around, and we'll talk about what we came across and how we dealt with it. These are the recommendations that came out from the Inquiry for Fatigue Management. They wanted to see an effective fatigue management program. Not to say there wasn't one there already, but they wanted to see more for obvious reasons because they wanted to demonstrate to all the stakeholders, remember that it's not just Cougar, but it's everybody in the community uh, that we had a program that was robust. And, and this, this program also focused on maintenance personnel. And you know, my background in, in aviation, and I've seen that in the civil side and the military side, there's a tendency to forget about the maintainers. That there's some inexhaustible supply of labor there that will just keep doing stuff and we just got to watch out for the pilots. And, and it was good because this setup that we were forced, forced to look at, but it was already in place, but to enhance was to look both at maintenance because they play a valuable role. You don't want them being dead tired working on the aircraft, especially complex aircraft like this. So the challenges that faced us is a radical change uh, to, to the way we're thinking. And then, you know, um, way back five, six, seven years ago, maybe we were thinking that, but even the rules were different then, and the knowledge pool of fatigue was different then. We know today, we know more than five years ago about it. And when you make a change, um, think of it like a damper, right? You get that initial impulse and displacement, and, and all the activity that goes in, you've got to watch the fatigue just for that change. And then there's the residual fatigue that will remain even after you transition. So, you know, there's new rules. And uh, the, the one I like is, uh, you know, everybody else in the organization, fatigue can almost make it a dirty word, you know, and it's not. Because uh, it seems to be counterproductive in all aspects. Either somebody needs more time off, or they can't work today because they're tired, or they travel, and now they can't. And you scramble around to try and find somebody else to do the job today. Um, and, and the support that it needs, and it's, and it's not readily apparent to the rest of the organization, like finance or other managers, uh, and so on, that, oh, um, you know, aren't we tired of talking about fatigue already? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's telling, and, and we said that to each other, and you have to come back. Uh, you know, the <laughs> basic fatigue regulation um, is just so simple. Well, sleep, uh, rest that much, and don't work more, more than a uh, certain amount of hours a day or a certain amount of hours of flying a month. That's about the extent of it. And then they, they come and say, okay, well then, so develop your own program. And so one of the things that, uh, no, I quote Tony Kern again, I think in the article that he wrote for his son in one of the magazines recently, he says, you know, you don't just need minimum standards. You look at an organization and say, what standards are we capable of? And it better be better than, than what than the basic regulation is. Otherwise, it just doesn't fit. And I think we were capable of so much better plan and fatigue. Uh, and, and that's what it was, you know, we, we said that the baseline uh, requirement of constant count is just not going to cut it. I mean, how do you work with a crew that uh, is on duty 12 hours for search and rescue, and there's another crew replacing them, but at the last hour of their uh, duty time, they may still have to do a five-hour rescue mission. 
and took some further creative thinking, and I have to say the team came with a pretty nice solution uh, for that. But all those things, working at my, uh, the RAM crew, all of a sudden they're going to be working later too, because now the day is longer again. So they, yeah, you can say it's still just a 12 hour shift, but they haven't been doing that for a while. And all these things, uh, SAR mission, you know, how long can you trade with NBT before it becomes, becomes counterproductive? Is it an hour? Is it a two hour trading session? Is the third hour useless? Why don't we look at that? So all these were challenges we had to look at. And then we made a plan. And uh, you know, the plan uh, is, uh, is ongoing. Uh, just like trading, team management has to be institutionalized. And I use the term with some of our customers and say, oh, let's stop apologizing for being human. That is just the way it is. Everybody understands you know, what they can do about that. And you'll be surprised. I mean, we had a meeting with Canada one time, and I took uh, Mike Doyle with me, who I'll talk about in a second. And uh, I said, wow, you know, we never knew these things about fatigue. I'm looking at them, they're a bunch of engineers and designers and everybody. They run an uh, extremely complex gas pump offshore. And uh, they say, well, is there something about fatigue? We know that they didn't know. And they said, please, come and teach us as well, so that we have a line and in step with you But when you talk about things like fatigue. And, and why is it not okay to get up at five, three in the morning and drive to work on ICO? Why is it not okay? Tell us why that is. It seems so simple. Uh, fatigue management models, uh, we used two things uh, about three years ago. We got in a, a consultant who works for the Canadian Defense uh, Organization, and he's a sleep expert. Uh, Michelle Paul, he came, looked at our schedule, looked at how we worked, and he made some recommendations. You have to be prepared to do that. Um, and another thing we did, uh, Mike Goran, he runs uh, service aviation safety. He came in, he was uh, quite well, he helped us develop our CRM program, and he taught everybody the basics. Uh, we had literally finance people even got interested in it. Not that that was important to them, but it, it showed the level of education we wanted to do the whole organization. You know, and it helps because when you talk about fatigue, everybody now is sort of in tune with, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. But the main reason was to teach the dispatchers, pilots, engineers, rescue specialists, and those operational personnel, what is it that makes us tired and, and, and introduces fatigue into the organization? What are the proper countermeasures? And, and how do we look out for each other? Why are you yawning the third time? Why don't you just drop a tool? Okay, should I ask a question? And from that, we uh, developed a policy. And the policy was just published, and in about a year's time, Uh, we we got to pull that policy back in and say, okay, what well, did not work? And we didn't have to go through that process. You know, admitting fatigue, socially unacceptable. The pilot or engineer will tell you to your face, no, I'm fine, good to go. So you can't just rely on that. You have to build in a few tools. Uh, for, for flight crew, we have a, a risk assessment uh, check sheet before flights, uh, and they, they get to score themselves on many areas, whether it's the third flight of the day. How many, how many flying have I done in the last seven days? Right? That's the basic stuff. How do I feel today? And, and the idea is not to stop anybody from flying, but the moment you write anything other than a zero, I want you guys to talk about it with the dispatch and say, how can you put a speed down? Well, you know, I've already done a flight today, or you know, I've done a flight today, I've been flying about the last seven days, and look, we've got two approaches coming up, one offshore and one over here. Why is that the right crew to use it as a guy that just started his ship yesterday? And we had a number of tools, like uh, dispatches, for example, has in their screen, When they brief a flight crew, they look at all the currencies right there and then, and then there's a number showing where you are in your ship. Because if he has a choice, if he has a choice of who to use, maybe he'll pick somebody else for a conference mission. Now, in a limited pilot pool, that's an idealistic view, and it doesn't always work, but that's a plan we, we're working towards if we get the right amount of people. And, uh, you know, you, you have to show leadership with this. So if somebody shows up for work and he says, well, guys, I, you know, baby was crying all night, whatever the case may be. They have to be willing to step up and say, okay, step aside. We'll find somebody else. I don't know how, but we'll do that. And you will not hear from our customers on that. And people like myself and our general manager, Hank, are sitting in that. We'll, we'll face that. But that's the institutionalization that's required, is that you are prepared to do that. And that individual must know it's okay. Now, there's going to be abuse here and there, but uh, it's, it's not the issue. People need to trust you that you will stand up for them and say, if I don't feel 100% of my game, you'll back me up, and that builds a bit of trust. I don't know if we're there yet, but we do get it, and I hope that we'll get it, that get it at it uh, as time goes on. But it requires proactive intervention at the bottom of what it says, and leadership in this area.
And the thing I want to add to this is, you know, is fatigue management for it to work properly, and I, was, I saw this happen in Cougar as we went through this process, is it has to become something that's cultural. It has to be a part of the organization's culture that fatigue is something that we manage carefully and there's nothing wrong with being tired. And I know there's some comment was made earlier about you know, probably the pilot's the last person you want to ask if they're tired. And it's true, you know, that most of us have been in that situation where you don't want to appear be weak or not part of the team, not being a good team player. So you'll say, yeah, I'm fine, I'll, I'll be good. And you need to have a culture where people are willing to speak up and, and, and realize you're not insulting someone by saying, I think you look tired and you're acting tired. I think it'd be better if you didn't go flying. And that's not an insult. I'm not dragging you down as a human being or as a pilot. It's just a matter of we all end up there every now and then. It's just a fact of life. And, and this is what I, I observed at Cougar and the, and the ability to do that and the willingness to do that. And that kind of leadership, not only at the crew level, but also at JJ's level, Hank's level, you could see it all over the place. And it made a big difference, especially with what we were trying to achieve here. And there's two other points. Uh, you know, as Keith said earlier, we, we tend to just focus on the pilots. But even in the maintenance department, we've uh, started thinking, OK, so, so what, are the, what are the triggers here? Uh, you know, if we, we start flying late, are we interfering in their maintenance schedule? Are we compressing them? and to do uh, things and, and where they had the luxury maybe before to say, well, complex tasks get done earlier in the evening so you don't do it in the heat, uh, dead of night. Uh, we introduced a risk management process whereby even a complex task gets risk assessed before and, and say, okay, well, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. We've got to do this complex thing because this is the time that we, we found we have to do it. Otherwise, tomorrow we don't fly. Well, let's step back from it and take, a, take an assessment. So just like the pilots have a risk assessment sheet they go through, complex tasks, the engineers started doing that as well. Now, uh, and, and the second point is we're by no means finished. Okay, we have a complex uh, travel schedule ahead of us to get over the night train, and we're compressing the night. If we start interfering in that, we're by no means finished, but I think we've made some interesting uh, touches on areas, and as a company, we've got a long way to go and, uh, and keep working on that. So conclusions. What we'd like to do here is just take everything we've told you now and just quickly summarize it so we can give you the essence of what we learned from this program. So this little picture I came up with uh, just uh, quickly one time because I'm trying to visualize, uh, you know, trying to manage all these things. And if you, <coughs> if you think of the, uh, you know, the project as the yellow area and that's the area you need to focus on and the green dot is me, my ability. But if I have a bunch of people around me that has a green dot as well and, and we all pay attention, you know, we cover all that's needed on the project, you know, you'll cover the whole, the whole uh, yellow area there. And you get different draws on you from different directions. And if you focus on one area too much, like the picture on the right, your focus changes. Everything keeps moving, the target, whether it's the risk that keeps moving, everybody's expectations. Today it's high, tomorrow, now we figure it out, let's relax on this area. Things keep moving. And you can't let one thing distract you, whether that's a person, that thing, red, red line on the standards, and those are just examples, whether it's a person, an issue, piece of equipment, if you distract it and allow me to draw it out, that's where your third party comes in and says, stop, that's been taking too much of your attention, and come back to the middle. So it's a little bit of a way to try and visualize, and that's what you're going to watch out for. And, and it helps to let people talk to you, and then take your ego out of the equation and say, no, tell me where we're going wrong. So managing the balance on the moving targets that you have in front of you, they are going to move. You just need to deal with that. Yeah, and this gets back to what I said earlier about risk migration. The risk was constantly moving on us, and that's why we, we realized early on in the program we had to completely reevaluate the risk on a, on a regular basis. Otherwise, we would miss something. So, overall, I talked about risk. This is extremely important. This is what helped get us through the process, not just once, but on a continuous basis. Having, having your risk methodology down, your principles down, and, and implementing on a continuous basis. Third-party validation can't overstate the importance of that. To make sure that you're not just convincing yourself that everything is working and everything's on the right track, you're getting feedback from others, professionals in the field, who are willing to tell you things that you may not want to hear. Training, we talked about this in great depth, but it is a keystone to the success of an implementation of a program like this for return to night flying. And the important part of this was not only the right tools, but having the right plan. And so the training certainly needs to be institutionalized. It can't be ad hoc. And especially in a program like this, where we're not only trying to do training, trying to implement a program, 
but oh, by the way, we still have to run a business. We still have to have continuous operations. And oh, by the way, our training for night flying is interfering, so there's risks now occurring where there was not risk before. Fatigue management, we, we've touched on that. Again, I'll go back to the whole thing. It's, it's got to be part of your culture, and that's what Cougar has done. And, and this was a long process in terms of making sure that people were aware that we're implementing this, this capability, not only returning back to night flying, but returning back to night flying, and oh yes, a SAR capability that does night vision goggles as well. So fatigue management had to be closely managed, not only because of the night flying part of it, but because we were trying to do something in addition in terms of implementing to our normal day operations. And it was about managing the balance between risk and capability. It was a continuous job. It was nonstop, and really the reason why we were able to get through this and get all the requirements answered and done to the satisfaction of the people at the senior levels was through effective leadership. And, and that leadership didn't come just from one person, like the Director of Flight Operations, it was there, but people like uh, Hank Williams, if Hank, could you stand up please? You know, th this, this guy put up with me being there all the time and coming up with all these wild ideas that uh, I got supported by JJ. But credit to him, you know, leadership, the leadership in the training side, Barry, stand up. He's going to hate me for this, but anyways, going to get him stand up. But, you know, and then you start looking at the operators. I would have imagined when I first came into this that the operators would have said, you know, we're interested in the bottom line. That's all we're interested in. We've got to make this happen, whatever the costs get going. But they were very supportive. And when we came back to them time and time again said, look, we said we're going to start in July. Uh, no, we're not going to be ready in July. It's actually going to be September. No, it's going to be November. They would say, why? But we're okay with it. And, you know, that kind of leadership when they're under their own pressures, and not only from a, sort of a business perspective, but from the community, that was amazing. And this, there were so many stakeholders in this, and I tell you, I'll tell you a little story. When I first showed up to work on this, I got in the cab at, at the St. John's Airport, and the I don't know if how many people have been in St. John's, but if you think you can get in a cab in St. John's and not talk to the cab driver, it's not going to happen. You know, they all talk to you. And he started talking to me. He said, so what are you doing here? Have you been here before? And I said, well, I'm here working with Cougar on night flying. And he looked at me and said, well, let me tell you my opinion on night flying. And, and for, th for 15 minutes into town, I got the detailed analysis of night flying. And I thought I had been properly briefed. And this was the cab driver. And what I learned was, that stakeholders, there's the obvious stakeholders and then the ones not so obvious, but they're very important. And especially in this program, the ones in the community, everybody in the community had an opinion about night flying. And we had to give presentations to different groups, whether they be unions or whether the general public, or I had to talk to CBC. And it was amazing to see the feedback. And, and all this plays into pressure, stress for the organization. And a credit to Hank Williams and his organization, they managed to weather that storm and get out the other side. The interesting thing is that it's not over yet. Um, so uh, where we are is still uh, a matter of a decision, uh, but it doesn't matter to us because I think we've grown as an organization going through this process. We're <coughs> stronger, our training is better, our team management is better, those key areas. And it, and it doesn't matter, we're ready. Uh, they have the issues to work, for and, uh, work through and that's their decision. But we did our part, and it's still happening to this day. There's still some distance to go. And it occurred to me that there's so many people in this room that's actually part of the story, not those that we identified. I mean, look at the table, if you find our insurance on the right. We've been telling the story for that for two years. They've been living with it, and maybe we shocked you a little bit with some of the details. You're worried the Now you've got the, the 90 minute version versus the 10 minute version of our like, uh, annual renewal. <coughs> I look at Terry over there, and you've come to do an audit on us last year with Exxon Mobil. So, uh, you know, everybody, uh, and, and just like St. John's, we're only a few degrees away from somebody that was affected by it. I think uh, there's, a, there's information here, and a lot of people I can validate whether they agree with us or not. This is what happened, and this is why I believe we did a good program. So, this is it. I, uh, you know, uh, we showed you what we've done uh, about it in. Uh, Take a few questions. I think we've got about 10 minutes left. Don't want to make you late for your coffee, so uh, it's over. So now you're in the search and rescue business. Um, my organization, we end up getting called in because we're the nearest aircraft to a search and rescue. It's not our job. We're not necessarily trained for it. So now you are. How, how are you going to deal with other stakeholders in terms of non business related search yeah. and rescue? How you, how you you know, it comes up all the time. Uh, it comes at night that we have capability and, uh, you know, I want to come back.
I can say, as Keith said, uh, search and rescue is the, the, the area of the national defense. That's their job, they have the mandate for the moment. What we are is another service that they can call upon, and that's the process. And that's uh, the Re rescue coordination center will inform us and say there's an issue, uh, can you help? Unfortunately, then we have to get our customers approved because we can't take the resource away. And um, they are good corporate citizens, they, they look at it, and if it's serious enough, they'll stop a bell ring and let us go. Or if uh, the flying activities for the day is over, we'll go and help out. And we've done so many times in the past. We've, we've got quite a number of uh, rescues in the area that we've uh, updated. So we're ready to go, but it's not our call. The rescue center calls us. They realize that there's something they can do, then we work with our customers on it. But your point is a very valid one. Is you see how you, you set up a search and rescue capability with a defined scope and it doesn't take very long for it to get out of the community and you know when there's something serious happening like a lost child or someone has had an accident slowly but surely you get dragged in, and it, there's that that force or that pull into becoming a search and rescue capability for all of the area and so managing with D&D &D through the rescue coordination center is key to that. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, we have definitely, uh, search and rescue is the, the responsibility of national defense and uh, we are not there to replace them at all. But we are available if they need help in a certain area and that's how we deal with that. That's why then. Tom. It is possible to work 
with customers, with the regulator, with rules, you come up with a solution, take your time, and do it. Be on the lookout for those items that will, that will change your focus and then draw your attention away from the moving targets that's out there. Thank you very much. For your time. Thank you.